You listening to the titled Passion for Purity by Pastor Paul Ricca, the International Director of Holiness Revival Movement Worldwide. Introduction The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Nothing but purity will make us to see God. In this generation there are confusions everywhere, one need to be very careful to be able to make heaven. As you read this book, the Lord will help you to be pure, not only pure, but have passion for purity. God bless you. Chapter 1 Passion for Purity What is passion? Passion means a strong desire, not just a desire, but a strong one. It is the heart's tension, because of something strongly desired, something wished, something that is to be done, or not to be done. Passion is an inner longing. You are burdened within your heart for something or against something. Passion is a strong determination. The passionate heart is only released when the desire is achieved. When that which is longed for is fulfilled, then passion is said to have been achieved. Passion, for instance we can say, he loves him with passion, with much force. The quantity of such love is deep inside. We can also say, she hates him with passion, which means that the force of the hatred is high indeed. But we are talking about the passion for purity. You can now understand, not only purity, but the passion for it. Wanting to be pure, and wanting it with passion, with a great desire. Wanting the pure life, the pure heart, with all desire and all determination. Your heart should be on it. Say to yourself I must be pure. I must be holy and perfect. Let the Bible open our eyes more to passion, as in Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 to 5 1 as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. To my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Three my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me where is thy God? For when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. 5 Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The Passion of the Psalmist. Passion is described by some terms. As the heart panteth implies the animal is looking for the water brooks, so that he can drink, and quench his thirst. Panteth is as when somebody runs, and after that he starts breathing heavily, making some heavy sound, because the force inside is high. The breath is also with high tension. He is releasing the air highly inside, because of the force generated by running. Panteth means you are looking for the thing so desperately, as if without it you will die. An animal in such a situation will be jumping, panting and looking for it. So panteth my soul after thee, O God. Does your soul long for God like this? There is high thirst inside me. Look at it, my soul thirsteth for God. When you see a man thirsty for God, there will be tension inside him that wants to be satisfied with the Holy One. Essa had passion for food. He was so hungry to the point that he sold his birthright. The desire was so much inside of him. It was ruling and controlling him. Passionate thirst for God. When shall I come and appear before God? When the word when is part of passion, it denotes desperation for time with God. When will this be achieved? When can I arrive at the solution to this? When will I appear? When will it be said I have gotten it? Such is the person looking for it with passion. My tears have been my meat reveals, I cry for it. I cry because of the longing. Tears fall from my eyes, passion. Because I long for this, I cry, I have no choice than to cry. For it? Tears will just fall from my eyes, running down on my cheeks. My heart is there. When will I get it? My tears have been my meat day and night reveals that passion is not a casual thing. Not just once in a while. I am in it. The desire is continuous. My longing is continuous, day and night. That is where my heart is. That is passion. Day and night as I remember these things, my heart is always there. There is a thought inside that is controlling him. And such thought always heats his memories. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Then why is this thing delaying? Why art thou cast down? Do you see how it affects him that such desire is delaying? I'm delaying to achieve this, why? Why art thou disquieted in me? There is disquietness and restlessness in my heart. Why am I restless? Because of passion. Why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Faith and hope in God. The passionate man has the hope and the faith that it shall be done. He is pursuing it with passion. It shall be done. He is running after it with passion. He encourages himself and said, God will help me. It shall be accomplished. 
Chapter 2. The Purity in Christ Hebrews Chapter 7, verses 25 to 27 says Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 26 For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. 27 Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. The scripture describes Jesus, when he came as a human being like us. What was his quality? What was his attribute? How did he live? What was his life? The Bible says, he was holy. Jesus is a human being, when he came to his own, and lived among us. He was holy, pure and undefiled. No defilement, no dirty thing was in him, in life, in language, in actions. In everything, no dirty thing. He was undefiled. He was harmless not hurting people about, not rude, not proud and nothing that would make people to be harmed. He was harmless. That is how Jesus was. He was separated from sinners. He did not live like sinners. He did not share life with sinners. He did not live in sin with sinners. He lived a separated life, not like a drunkard, a fornicator, a thief or a liar. He was totally separated from sin, pure and holy. That was his life. God wants to take us to this point of being pure, holy, undefiled, separate from sin and sinners. He wants to carry you to that point. He wants to bring you to that standard. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them two things, his ability and his intercession to take you to that point. That you are pure, perfect, with no sin in your life. There is no defilement in your tongue, in your heart, in your body, and in your nature. There is no defilement just like as he was. So, he is able to take you there. That is the vision you should see. That is the vision for purity and the vision for holiness. See it there. That is where God wants to take you. Are you seeing that tall tree over there? It is holiness, it is purity. God wants to take you to that tree. You will seed under that tree. He wants to carry you there. You will eat the fruits of that tree, it is the vision. That tree is your destination. That is where God wants to take you to. That is where he is. So you have seen the vision. Then believe in his ability to take you there, because he is able. Forget about the infirmities of your bodies, forget about your natural weakness and your corrupt environment. Believe in him, that he is able to take you there. You have seen the vision, so believe in God. Release yourself to him to carry you there. He knows the way to take you there. You will eat the fruits of that tree. You will enjoy the shadow of that tree. You will enjoy the cool breeze under that tree. The Lord will take you to that point of holiness. His intercession, that is grace. It is not your strength at this time, but the supply of grace. His prayer to God for you will supply the grace. You just believe. With the supply of grace, you will arrive at perfection. You will arrive at purity of heart you will arrive at the holiness of life. God will help you. It is an instantaneous experience, as soon as you ask for it in faith through prayer. When the Lord said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 3, Son of man, will these bones live? Because they were very dry, he knew how to answer God, thou knowest. Because with your eyes, you could be discouraged, but since God has brought you there and shown you, don't go by your eyes. Faith. Thou knowest. You are able by his power and supply of grace. I can be pure. My heart will be pure. My life will be pure. I will live a holy life. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 to 14 says, For the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. 14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God? The scripture is giving us assurance here. Before Jesus came, men who worshipped God lived by the purifying work of the blood of animals, goats, heifers etc. By the blood of animals as they offered sacrifice, animals were killed for men, and they were forgiven in the past. Because the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it must die, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20. And God bore, that an animal could die instead of man, so that the law should be fulfilled that sin is paid by death or paid with death, shading of blood as a type of Christ in Old Testament. Once a sin is committed, e.g. once a lie was told, in the record of God, and in the dealing of God, in the telling of that lie, a life had to die for it. An animal had to die, because a lie had been told. If one entered into the sin of sex, for that one art of immorality, an animal had to die for that immorality to be forgiven. Nothing but death could settle it. You could do it, and say I am sorry, but an animal had to die. 
you are sorry on the account that somebody have to die or would have to die for that sin to be forgiven you. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, normally an animal has to die for each sin, if you have committed sin, an animal had to die. And by the death of the animal, God forgave sins, cleansed from sin, and took the record of the sin away from your life because an animal had died. The Bible says, if the blood of animals could be considered by God because an animal suffered for you, its suffering and death could be considered by God to represent your death. And so sin is overcome. How much more shall the blood of Christ which is higher than animal? How much more shall the death and suffering of Christ greater than animal, purer than animal, the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge you? How much will this blood settle permanently the same problem in your life? How much will the power of this blood purge sin from your consciences and settle the sin matter in your own life? Therefore, have confidence in Christ. He can bring you to that perfection because of his blood, the superiority of his blood, his death for every life. Animals had to be dying regularly because men were sinning all the time. Some people would fall today, fall tomorrow. But Christ died once. What does it mean? That he died once? It means he can bring you into the point of purity and you will remain there. You don't go back to sin anymore. He brings you to the point of purity. He purifies you to the point that you don't sin anymore. In I John chapter 2. Verse 1, the Bible says my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. I write unto you that you should not sin. Why? He has died for you. Jesus is not dying every day. That means you should not be sinning every day. Although the mercy of God is there for those who sin, he says come back. Jesus is still there. Look back to him and restore yourself to perfect purity. Not that you should be sinning, no. The Bible says in I John chapter 3 verse 9 that whosoever that is born of God doth not commit sin. Why are you sinning? Does Christ need to be dying every day? No. You say you know that we are imperfect Christians. God knows that we can be sinning every day. These are words of people of the world, those who are yet to know Jesus deeply. Does Christ die every day? No. Then why must you be sinning? He is able to save them to the uttermost. He is able to bring you to the perfection of life by that one death because of his blood, the blood of Christ. Have confidence in that blood. Believe it. There are people that have believed and are living daily in righteousness and holiness. There are people that are living like that. Their lives are clean, holy and perfect. God has died for you once. By that once and only death, it means you come to Christ and get established in his purity. Your purity continues. That is what the word of God is telling us. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Husbands, love your wife, as Christ also loved the church. What is the church? It is a body of believers. As many that are born again, they are the church, members of his own body. How did they get born again? Because Christ died for the world, Christ died for sinners. They believed on the Lord Jesus and became born again. Being born again, they have become part of the church of Christ. The Bible tells us Christ died for the church and for the sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for sinners, for our sins according to scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. Christ came to save sinners. He died for our sins. He died for sinners. He died for the world. But in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 25 to 27. He died for the church. What for? To purify the church sanctify it and to present unto himself a glorious church. It means the message of purity and holiness comes to the church. The message of repentance gets to the sinners in the world. When you go to the world, preach and say, repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when you come to the church, he died for the church, for the holiness of the church. Then he tells the church, submit yourself for the purification of your life. Purify your heart, sanctify your heart and submit yourself again to Christ. As the sinners believed on him to be saved from their sins, come to Christ and believe on him also for your purity, so that he can give you uttermost salvation. He is able to save you to the uttermost. He can do cleansing in your life called sanctification and upgrade your life to a holy standard 
that you don't need to be sinning and say sorry I have told a lie, sorry I do this, sorry I do this, etc. No. He is bringing you to the state of continuous purity. He died for the church. He died for you who have believed already. The gospel of heart purity comes to you and to the church, why? Though we have come to love Jesus, there are things we do as we live among one another. We do things that are bad. We still manifest some pride, and we are still competing with one another. We are still angry against one another. We envy one another. You are singing in the choir, but there is a struggle between you and your sister. You notice that there is some holiness in you, but some little lies are still being told. Note that Sarah was not born again, but when Sarah was challenged, she said, No, I did not say such thing. God said, You said it, why are you lying? Was not Sarah a godly woman? Godly but there were still lies. All these impurities will go as you believe the gospel of sanctification, so that your heart comes to the higher level. The Lord will strengthen that heart with holiness. Amen. You can now live the holy life. Some little stubbornness and rebellion that is seen in the church, you are always self-willed, very strong in your will, even when things are not good, you say I am a leader. I am a Christian, if I preach, signs and wonders will follow, etc. But your life is not good enough. There is something you know that is not complete in your life. Christ died for the church. You are part of that church. Christ died for the church to cleanse it. You need another cleansing work of Jesus to purify you. You need another purifying work of Jesus. The first one was done when you were taken from sin and cleansed to come to the church as a believer. Now you are a believer and you are in the church. Then the second one has to be done to pick you as a believer, cleanse you, sanctify you and then render you to the holy life. Christ died for sinners. He died for the world, the first provision of water, the water of regeneration. By it the sins of the sinner are washed. For ye are washed by the water of regeneration but then, Christ provided another water. He died for the church, for what? This is that other water, sanctification, inner purity. It is a second touch of purity which is also a second touch in holiness and a second touch in righteousness that you might now be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Therefore, you now maintain the life of holiness. If we now say let us go out for evangelism and preach to people, what do you tell them? Repent and believe in Jesus, accept Jesus and your sins shall be forgiven and you will have a new life. Then, we will preach to you also, come to that same Jesus for the sanctification of your heart as you told the sinner, to come for his repentance. As a Christian he died for you too, that you should be sanctified. Your heart should be purified in the first instance, but it needs a second purification, to bring you to that point in which you are without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. As you flow in holiness. Take note, he died for us once. He does not need to die daily. It means that you should come up to holiness and continue in it. It is not for you to be holy today, and tomorrow you fall and say, Jesus died again for me. Please, no come to a standard life, one death is the provision. Christ can keep you in holiness all the days of your life. Luke chapter 1. Verses 74 to 75. That he would grant unto us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, 74 in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. He died once to achieve this. So why sin today and sin tomorrow? No. Don't do that. All the days of our lives, consistency in righteousness is what God wants us to achieve holiness and righteousness before God. Before the world, even our preaching and our prayer is an offense. The world, your neighbor might see your preaching and say you are a wicked person. This is because you preach nothing but the hard truth which the people of the world would not comprehend. Removing jewelries and not painting again will make you an offense to your husband. So, you will not be an accepted person. Before him, you are an evil woman. But before God, who seeth the heart, he will see you through because of this work that Jesus has done in your life. He will see you holy and righteous all the days of your life. Chapter 3. Passion for personal purity Now that you have known the purity in Christ, how do you obtain it, that this thing should be real in your life? Matthew chapter 5. Verse 6 Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst. Remember our passion. There is a force inside, a strong desire inside you looking for a state of purity and a heart of holiness that should be there. Let us see that passion, let us see that force, let us see you running, let us see you panting and let us see you weeping. Let us see you crying and longing, for you shall be filled. God will fill you, and God will give you purity. He who sees your struggle will satisfy you and you shall be filled. Psalms chapter 139. Verses 23 to 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. 
24 and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You see a man that does not want any wicked way in him. He will not take it. God, I cannot take away the wickedness in me, come and help me. How can I be manifesting pride? How can lie come out of my mouth? God search me, check me up and if there is anything in me, cleanse me from it, purge me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. If you wash me, I will be clean. If you purge me, I will be whiter than snow. Search my life and see if there is any wicked way in me and make me perfect. Can you see a man with a passion? This type of man will not live with anger. This type of a Christian will not allow anger to be in him. He must carry it to God and say it must not be there. This type of a Christian cannot allow lying lips. No. Oh, what did I say yesterday? Oh God, forgive me. Let it not repeat itself again. It must not. This type of Christian cannot allow lust. What, how did I feel, what happened? Not me again by his grace. God, this cannot be in my life. This kind of a Christian cannot allow pride. God, I did some performance before people and I am feeling high. What is causing that? I can't allow it to remain. This is the passion that is required to achieve purity. It's because of this that you will go to God and give him no rest until he establishes you. Passion is the power inside and a strong desire. You will pray and pray till you arrive there. I told you the vision of holiness and purity is that tall tree you are seeing there. That is your destination. You need to eat the fruit of that tree. You need to be under the leaves of that tree and enjoy the shadow. But there are people that tell their congregation, it is not possible. No destination is set before them. You cannot achieve anything you don't have as a goal. But Jesus is ready to save to the uttermost. He is ready to take you over there, to the point of that vision he has set before us, to perfect us, and to purge us, so that we can be pure. Daniel had passion for purity and that was what made him to still maintain his purity in hard circumstance and hard environment. Dan. 1.8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Passion for purity will make you pure in the face of Nebuchadnezzar. It will make you pure in the face of a violent man. It will make you pure in the face of death, because you are for purity of inner heart. You are so watching yourself that you will never allow sin. You are always checking every step you take as a believer. Have you seen a pussy cat? When the pussy cat runs from here to there, he will stop and lick his body. Every dust that has come upon him, he will lick it out. Even the very legs that touch the ground, he will lick it up and clean it. Have you seen those who are used to it like that, it worked for them. Have passion for purity. You must check up yourself. Check up and lick up anything, anything that is sin in your body, must be licked out. Passion. Daniel purposed in his heart. How do I keep anger and malice? Not me by his grace. It is not possible. I cannot allow it. I check myself. After I have spoken, and I watch, did I speak evil, did any evil come out from there? How much more when I noticed that I spoke evil, that evil must not repeat itself. Passion. The heart is made up. I must be pure. That is what God wants me to be. Make up your mind like that, that you must be pure. Examine yourself daily. Check up yourself constantly in all manner of life. In the house, in marriage, in business place, in the church, in Christian ministry, in everything, check up. Examine your attitude towards money, people, women and vis vis vicissitudes of life. Check it up, don't allow it. Daniel purposed in his heart. Not even before men, not before armed robbers will you tell lies. You cannot. He that is born of God does not commit sin. He does not sin. He cannot sin. He is born of God. Make up your mind. You cannot sin before armed robbers. You can't sin. You can't tell lies because you want to escape. Escape from where, when you have God watching you. Make up your mind. Let not people see that you use lie to cover the truth about you that is evil. Not possible. Daniel purposed in his heart. That is passion. In this way therefore, you have purity. Acts chapter 24 verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. I exercise purity in conscience. I exercise myself to maintain a pure conscience. Is there anything I'm not clear about, am I sinning here? Am I not sinning here, is there anything wrong? Take it to God in prayers until the light comes there. Always have a conscience void of offense. Pure conscience. Purity in the eyes purity in your eyes Job chapter 31, verse 1 and 2, I made a covenant with mine eyes, why then should I think upon a maid? 
2. For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? I made a covenant with mine eyes. As I work on the street and I see the nakedness on the street, why will I be walking into the nakedness of a woman? What am I doing that for? What portion of God is there in a maid? Is it going to make me righteous, more righteous? Is it going to give me grace? For the Christian life and service, is it going to make me sing and bless God? What portion is there that I should be putting my eyes on and looking unto their nakedness? Never. I'm talking about the one with passion for purity. His eyes are regulated, he turns them away from beholding vanity like the dance. They are dancing disco there. These things they are dancing in the television and women dancing in nakedness, what pleasure do I derive therefrom? Which way do I receive anointing? Which way do I receive grace? If I fix my eyes on those boys, corrupt boys on the screen that are dancing with the corrupt girls, they are out there in pants, with their breasts exposed with their nakedness, should I take pleasure? It will corrupt my heart. This is purity in the eyes. Purity in the tongue James chapter 1. Verse 26, If any man among you seems to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You have grace, you have a gift and you have a calling, bridle and control your tongue, otherwise you are deceiving yourself that you are serving God. But you are performing vanity. That is what the scripture is saying. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue or controls it not, deceives himself. For in many things we offend all. The tongue is a little member, but it is set on a fire of hell. James chapter 3. Verses 2 to 6. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Control your speech and your tongue. Take care of what you say. There must be holiness in the tongue and purity in the tongue, if the tongue will be addressed. 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. For behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. 5. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. The only story given in scripture for someone that was found alive in hell and recorded, is the torment of the tongue. He did not talk about the eye, he did not talk about the mouth, and he did not even talk about the private part of that man, which must have committed a lot of immorality but the tongue. It talks about the tongue that was passing through the fire of God, the fire of hell. The rich man in hell said, send Lazarus that he might deep just a tip of water with his finger, and cool my tongue. Were not the eyes burning? the nostril consumed, the ears, private part, and the hairs of the head burning? But the tongue? And God says, he is able to save you to that point in which you will not offend with your tongue. It is possible? Our God is able and by his intercession and grace, it is going to work. It will work for us. He will bring you to that point in which you don't offend with your tongue. May the Lord do it for your life. Amen. Purity in the ears. Take care of what ye hear. The weight of a tale-bearer does great evil. Turn away from the foolish man when thou perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. Be careful because that which you hear can provoke you to wrong action. Therefore, check the report well. Check who gives that report that they do not in turn defile your action and defile your life, because what somebody may tell you of another, may turn your loving heart to hatred against that person. Purity in the world. James chapter 1. Verse 27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To be unspotted from the world, and the activities of the world like the love of the world, association and friendship with the world. You should be careful where you work. In that office, let the activities of the world not overcome you. Be careful that you are not overcome with the love of money, the root of all evil. Purity and the beauties in the world, the world is a world of beauty. Even the animals are beautiful. Men and women are beautiful. Be very careful that the beauty of the world does not carry you away. You don't go and be lusting after beauty. The Bible says favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Beauty is vanity. Don't set your heart there. Money, when riches increase, set not your heart there. So be careful. Keep yourself pure. Don't go into wrong action because you need money. Chapter 4, Passion for the Purity of Others. In passion for others' purity, we want the purity of others. Psalms chapters 12, verse 1 Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Can you see this man? 
this is a passionate man appealing for the purity of others. God's purity is failing in the church. You can't find holiness in the church anymore. The godly man ceaseth. I am seeing corruption entering into the church, entering people and entering into godliness. The people are falling. The people are corrupting. Go to the churches and see how people dance. When we see the corrupt dances that are in the churches, we then hold our stomach like a woman in labor. God's righteousness has gone. The godly man has ceased. Can you do these things you are doing and still be holy? No, it is not possible. The two cannot go together. Pride has come into your body. Now, attention is in bodily demonstration. The drums have taken over the words of the songs. You are not even hearing the words of the songs anymore. The people playing the drums don't have God in mind. They have you, how to entertain you, how to move your body, that is what is in their mind. The godly man is crying, that righteousness has died here. Help God, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. When we come to hear stories about some of these pastors, the immorality they do in their churches, the corruption, demonism employed in ministries, we cry. Godliness has ceased. We are crying, God restore holiness, restore purity back to your people. That is our prayer and that is our cry. When we see the way people display zeal in wrong adornment, displaying zeal for God, zeal for evangelism, we cry. Lord rise up. Something is happening. The people are robbing cream without taking bath. Day after day, they have not taken bath, they are only robbing cream. That is neither hygiene nor cleanliness. Help Lord for the godly man ceaseth. The faithful fails. We look from church to church. A particular lady said, in a divine revelation, the Lord took her from church to church, and in a big church, to see how many righteous people were there. 2-3. What happened to the others? The godly man is ceasing. When you go to a place and find 20 godly people, by the time you come tomorrow, 5 is gone out of them remaining 15. Help Lord. The godly man ceaseth. The faithful ceaseth. They are getting too few among men in the society. The devil is swallowing up these people. The enemy is advancing. He is capturing towns and cities and is getting nearer to the headquarters. We cry for purity in the church. Romans chapter 10 verses 1 to 3, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Two for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Three for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. My heart desire and prayer to God is passion for others' purity. This is your concern for the salvation of others and these other ministers who go on missions missionaries to the foreign lands but commit immorality there. God in doing many good works makes one pure and holy. The Bible says, though ye give yourself to be burned and have no charity, it profited you nothing. I Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. If I even give in service, in sacrifice, in giving, but no holiness, purity, and righteousness, it profiteth me nothing. Yet great work is going on. One man can build a whole church, yet no righteousness in him. He is having the second wife with him. O oh Lord, I am crying. My heart's desire is that these churches should come to the knowledge of truth. Otherwise, the wicked shall be turned to hell, and all churches that forget God. All churches that don't know His holiness shall be turned to hell. They started well, taught these people well but eventually, corruption entered into it, and they have lost their reward. Their righteousness shall never be remembered. Their services shall never be remembered. All the sacrifices, the persecution they face in life shall never be remembered. For the iniquity they have allowed into their congregation, for that iniquity they shall die. Take every step required to recover them. Take every step required to recover them, because God is not a respecter of any persons. When Moses did a thing not worthy of entering the promised land, God told Moses you are not entering there. God is not a respecter of persons. And the Bible says better is the end of a thing than the beginning of it, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8. Why are these men ending this way? Why is this glorious church ending this way? And the end is better than the beginning. All the history you have made. All the records you have made will become vanity. That is why we struggle passionately to make others righteous, recover them and bring them back to the truth. Romans chapter 9 verses 1 to 4 shows that these people have the scripture. They are not people of other religions. They are not pagans, and they are not Muslims. They are having the scripture, they have come to the point they can read. They have theological schools. What has happened to them, why have they become so ignorant? When I lie down I pant. What happens? Why have you come to that point, and yet to have this understanding you cannot, 
Do you get this knowledge to perfect your work for presentation? How do you present to God that which is not perfect? That he might present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Your cloth is already okay, but there is something there that needs just to be removed. You cannot be presented to God. I feel bad. For this reason, I wish that I myself could be accursed, let them come in. What has brought them to this blindness? We are wishing them. We are laboring, fasting and praying to God to open their eyes. Elisha prayed for his servant and God opened his eyes, that he might see the host of angels, so that he will stop being afraid. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant, and when he saw that indeed divinity is around them, he became quiet. Let God open their eyes. That is the prayer we pray. This is passion for others' purity. We cannot